Well, thank you so much. Uh, some people say that my last name could work as a password, but that's probably a little bit old statement uh, nowadays. Uh, as you can see, I'm Paul Ayanushkevich, and what I'm simply doing for a living is cybersecurity for the past, that sounds scary, like 20 years. And uh, my company, uh, Secure, it's something that I have established um, actually 15 and a half years ago right now. So uh, honestly, I had also a chance to look at how cybersecurity is shifting, and I've been always working as a pen tester and I do that till today honestly even though as you can see on the slides my role it's uh, to be a CEO of the company nobody in IT actually teaches you how to do that right and uh, my team right now it's uh, 65 people which is quite uh, challenging uh, and um, and I'm kind of like one leg here one leg there but we were just talking about it that I'm not leaving projects because this is my life and this is really what I love and that management thing unfortunately or fortunately I have to uh, handle with uh, but anyhow uh, being engaged in cybersecurity and also uh, having legally access to the source code of Windows really helped me out to understand what is happening in the infrastructure. And uh, just a couple of comments uh, regarding uh, the tools and so on. So um, after every every uh, like moment uh, we are sharing something and we speak and so on, we always share tools. And uh, this button is going to be the QR code that uh, you're going to find the tools underneath with. So uh, please scan it. Yeah, <laughs> who's going to do that, right? But anyway, uh, just for the ethics, if you don't want to do that, there is like a link next to it so that you can type, or at least you can verify if the QR code is actually taking you to uh, that particular link. It is, it is, so um, all good. So overall, of course, anything that I'm going to be talking about, the tools that are ours, you're going to find over there. We wrote over 200 of them, so basically uh, that's the setup. So now what we're going to talk about? Well, simply hackers' perspective and uh, prior priorities to focus on, interesting angles to focus on for the upcoming season, year, and so on. And before I start, a little bit of a story, if you don't mind, because uh, literally in our team, and I guess in your team, stories are happening every day, every week, maybe even, because when there is an incident, there is a story behind. And uh, interesting story that I've got uh, for you for today is actually related with our customer that, like... 100%, if I mention the brand, you'll know the brand, because it's a brand from the retail environment. So you might have been in these stores. That's the point. So what is happening is that on Friday, uh, I'm just, you know, checking email as we all do, yeah, <laughs> all the time. And eventually I'm saying, hey, Paula, there is an incident. We have an incident. Would you mind and your team joining on the call? Because there's something we can do about it and so on. And uh, okay, good, 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 good. Yeah, so I already say goodbye to the weekend because you know how it is. Uh, but okay, I'm joining. And um, what do I see? Yeah, and I'll be completely honest with you because I find it extremely funny. Um, I'm joining. And what I see on the team's call is that there's like 40 guys. And it's just myself. And they're asking me what to do. You know how it feels? It's actually pretty, like, of course, I'm not showing that, but I'm kind of having this, like, funny. <laughs> and eventually, and eventually, uh, they do ask that question. And I'm saying, well, you tell me what happened first. And they're like, here's the thing. We don't exactly know what happened. How do you know? You are like a multi-billion company out there, and uh, you don't really have these systems as supposed to tell you what executed where, what happened, do you have any ransomware, do you have any like dodgy connections to where, and so on, they don't know. And as it appeared, the company that you would expect that's going to have a really nice infrastructure, and no judgment really for them, but it's a situation that we are dealing with, is actually managing the stores using VMC, and there's literally nothing you know, in terms of security on the computers in these stores. So the thing is that, how do you get the indicator of the compromise? Well, you have to connect through the VMC, do the manual scanning, like, well, not maybe in old times, but uh, in general, you have to spend your time. And time is definitely money for them, because there is a big question of the universe, will they open stores on Saturday morning? And the CISO is all the time with me on a call. It's like, hey, can we open the stores? Can we open the stores? I'm like, I don't know yet. Like, we are still collecting the data, and we need to know what's going on. So what happened? What happened is that someone introduced the ransomware eventually using the USB device, 
uh, on one of the computers in one of the stores. That gets spread out because they were using all the same local administrators' passwords on all of the stores around the world. Just for the reference, 3,000 stores. And, if, and eventually, what was the case is that that thing, let's call it, was connecting to the global firewall. Global firewall identified that as a malicious IP with the bad reputation, and it blocked it. Whew. Because what would happen if that wouldn't be blocked? All the stores would be smashed, and they literally said that if that would happen, there would be nothing to clean up. They will need to send human beings to every single store to fix these computers in order to be back to the operations, and that would be the moment where store would need to function. Otherwise, you would just pay cash, for example, yeah, or not. So what was interesting over there is that there was a lot of things that was just wrong. And what was wrong? Well, besides just saying that everything was wrong and the local admin password is the same, like no security solutions, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, then of course, if we put it on a list, this is the list, yeah? So VNC management time, literally no network segmentation, missing critical updates and stuff like that. So what is interesting is that when we look into stats, you can see that this is from the IBM cause of a data breach report that Obviously, when we are using solutions that are allowing us to discover things, it takes faster. So when the solutions are AI supported or leverage some kind of an intelligent threat detection, it's not a big deal to think that it's going to take us shorter to identify the threat. And that is so meaningful. Now, another story that comes to the place is that we literally yesterday finished the report for the customer. Uh, we are working with a different, different types of customer. And this is actually uh, the production farm in Bangladesh, a big production farm in Bangladesh. And obviously, they got smashed. So the ransomware went there, and then someone is demanding three bitcoins, which is actually, I would say, very cheap in terms of uh, the ransom. So it's like approximately $200,000. So yeah, but depends for who really. Yeah? And eventually, um, they wanted to pay. So we were taking part in negotiations. And eventually, they paid, and they got nothing. It's a sad story. Yeah. Sorry that I'm laughing. I mean, it's just an irony, right? Uh, but at the end, what was the point of entry? You will not believe. There was a third-party developer that was just not even working at that company, but cooperating, that was just writing some code for them. And we found out, as a matter of internet research, that he actually published that piece of code on the GitHub with all public access, and there was literally a domain admin username and password with the company name, like everything given on a flight. Gosh, like when we discovered that, we were like, no way. Like, do you know this guy? Yep, we know him personally, actually. Yep, we're going to call him. Like, what? So people were fired over there. It's, it's a very sad story. And at the end, just because of this guy. And what fascinates me in this world is that when we look into cybersecurity spectrum, you've got a user, a guy like that, a developer or someone bringing a USB device for the big names, big brands. And on the other side, you've got millions of laws. How could it be that from this, we get there? Something is wrong. And when you look at this statistic, you can see that in here, 64% of the companies, they do not have an incident response plan in place. Not to mention that they did not test it because they don't have it, yeah? But at the end, what is interesting is that when the breach occurs, then they don't know what to do. And also, from the IBM's report, you can see that 197 days, this is the average time hackers remain in the infrastructure before they are found out. That's satisfying, because when I think about it, okay, that's scary, but at least someone found it. Good, it's not like 300 days. Yeah, it's 197. So it's a kind of a success, because at least we know that. But obviously, Objectively, we know this is a little scary. And 69 days, it's the average time after detection to full recovery from the moment you detect it to the team that comes to place, recovers things, pays the ransom, and so on. Now, here's a funny fact, uh, honestly. For that company in Bangladesh, obviously, when they got smashed, they got encrypted, then the manager over there uh, was like, we need to have this working on Monday, yeah? I was like, how, how, how? Like, do you have a backup? No. Yeah. Okay. So what are we going to do? And uh, obviously, there is a negotiation with the hackers. But the problem right now, problem on the problem, something to consider is that there are different regulations, especially in the European Union and in the world, in the US, also have their own and so on, that basically you cannot pay the ransom if you do not know 
who you are paying to, which is technically impossible. Because who's going to say, like, hey, I'm the one accepting the ransom over there. Hello. Yeah. Like, this is my passport. Yeah. This is not happening. And the problem was that they couldn't pay the ransom directly because otherwise uh, their government will say that they are sponsoring the terrorism and they cannot pay here to this country that, 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 that. So there are certain regulations. And we had to hire a digital assessments redemption company that also gets the pretty good salary, by the way, because they earn approximately $10,000 just to transfer the money. Uh, uh, over the over the bit wallet, uh, so the so through the with the bitcoins, and eventually um, this was just their job. It's a pretty cool business model, I thought. But anyway, uh, this is exactly what what happened over there, and this was lasting three weeks. So not Monday, definitely not Monday. So long story short, um, AI, of course, it's coming in. And I, sh and I know that you are tortured with AI subject right now. Me too. AI everywhere. But the thing is that when you look at the threat um, detection and also searching for vulnerabilities, these processes are right now supported with AI. You've got a different platforms that allow you to find vulnerabilities. And why should we sit and do it manually? We can, which is always very priceful. But at the end, uh, supporting yourself with a little bit of automation never hurts. So the question that I'm always asking myself is like with this all cool stuff that we got, is hacking really easy or not nowadays? And uh, some of us will say yes, because of the simple things that are happening. Some of us will say no, if the company is prepared, but okay, depending really on the threat factor that we got. Let me show you a little bit of a demo here. So what we're going to be doing is basically related with the analysis of the system with the simplest possible thing. So this is like a warm-up demo. And uh, when we're going to do the who am I and then slash all, you can see that I am here the local administrator. And let's start with that for now. And within the local administrator, basically, we're going to see here that user is obviously fully privileged, but domain-wise, user is just a domain user. Now, I would love to show you one thing. We're going to be playing with the scheduled task, which is obviously extremely easy, but... I would love to show you what is actually the power of impersonation when we've got even a session that's disconnected. And in this particular case, yeah, if we try to connect, you can see that we don't have that kind of possibility. Yeah, so I don't know the password for an admin, that's it. I just see that there has been some administration work happening, and that's pretty much it. So what would be interesting over there is that we're going to be, first of all, creating a little script that's probably over-exaggeration for the script. Uh, but the second, we're going to be checking, of course, what's the access to the domain. So if you're going to do the net user hack me one and then password one, and then we're going to do add to the domain, you can see that access is denied, which is what we expect. So question is, how do we actually escalate to the domain based on a little bit of a misconfiguration? So in this case, also to show you that we might be thinking, okay, worry about not like running like a Mimi cut. No, 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 not in this situation because there is an antivirus and we are not able to run it, yeah? Or whatever solution, whitelisting, whatever, we are not able to run it, yeah? That's just make it clear. So the next part, we are finding, okay, so what can I do as a local admin? Maybe LAPS is also implemented so I cannot get the hashes. I cannot use maybe the VSS admin and things like that. But just because that session is there, I would be able actually to escalate a little bit. So first, let's create the script so that at the end, we are able to move forward and uh, become possibly a domain admin. Yeah. So then text document, let's call it basically the script. Yeah. And in this case, let's just paste the stuff yeah, so you're going to see that we've got here an echo, and then this, this is just for the log TXT to see what was going on, and then we got a net user, easy hack, password one, so let's just change that script, script, scripts, and so on, and then we've got a net group domain admins, and the next part is basically DSACLs, and we are uh, setting up the, uh, in this case, admin as the holder, so this is a little bit of persistence that is always good to have when you are performing even the pen test, because some administrators might delete your account because they are, they feel violated. Yeah. But anyway, that's a different type of a story. Uh, I had one time administrator that was, by the way, crying uh, just because I became domain admin. That was really satisfying. Anyway, <laughs> let's move forward. 
<laughs> so uh, literally he had tears in his eyes. It was really cool. Uh, so uh, let's move forward to task scheduler. And uh, eventually we're going to get into uh, the scheduled task. And we're going to literally create a basic, basic uh, scheduled task. So uh, nothing special about it. Uh, but um, just an easy whatever daily, whatever we don't care about that. Next, next, next. Start a program. And then we're going to get into our script. So within the scripts, um, we've got uh, this one next. Okay, good. And then open the properties, finish, and these are the properties. And we're not running this one as a James Bond, but we are running it with the highest privileges. And in this case, and just because this guy can change the schedule task, this guy is going to pick account that he wants to run this on. So it could be an admin, for example. For me, this is a Yoda master guy. And then basically we're going to run it as an admin. Yeah, but we could kind of could think that, well, domain admin is supposed to authenticate or something like that. Well, not, not necessarily. That's the point. So what we're going to just do, and that's actually one of these moments, we're just going to do run, yeah, and then within the lock, as you can see, we've got over there a lock uh, script, and we've got a domain admin basically created over there. So, uh, so the, this uh, user that we have uh, set up. And of course, the next stage, it could be that we're going to be checking for it, yes? So we can do the net group, and then domain admins, and then we're going to do domain, and then as you can see, one of the users that is actually domain admin is an easy hack. So it's hacking easy, yeah? I would say, yeah, yeah. So it depends on the setup, depends on the conditions, but when we do the pen test, and that's my point, pen test started to be in some, like, more popular, obviously, and that's what I see, especially from the perspective of time, and uh, there's also an obligation to do the pen test, especially when you look into Dora and so on, which is going to be valid in, in July, uh, so that's good for us. But question is, shouldn't we shape the pen tests in a little bit of a different way? That we are not just checking, of course, how the infrastructure looks from the vulnerabilities perspective, but we do it under the umbrella of, in general, analyzing the threat profile for the organization. And uh, this is also perceived differently from the customer's perspective, because everybody is like Pentas, but at the end, is there something new about it? And just, just a tip, because also business-wise, uh, I think it's time to do the Pentas with a little bit of a bigger picture and a little bit of a bigger skill set in terms of suggesting people how they can change their infrastructure, how to check for their configurations, and so on. So it just becomes a bigger and richer service. So in general... Is hacking easy? A little bit, I would say yes. So that's why I'm putting on one comment, yeah? Investing into a human factor. Now check this out. We all know deep fakes. But the question is, do we see attacks that are actually happening with deep fakes? Someone could say, hey, deep fakes are just like so badly looking, yeah? But obviously we can guess that with the AI and growth of technologies, deep fakes is going to become, or they maybe are already, part of a big threat against the employees in the companies. And we see that totally happening for our customers. So just have a look. Here we can see, according to Onfido, that there is a 3,000% increase year on year in terms of a deep fakes threat. That's like, boosh. So question is, how can we technically look at the deepfakes from a little bit of a different angle? And what I would love to show you, it's a little bit of a quick review of the apps that are for deepfake creation. It's going to be quick, but I want to show you one conclusion. We decided to take a couple of apps in our studio on the table, and we are like, is it really the threat? Like, is it really that hacker needs to be spending lots of money, lots of time in order to be having actually a good deepfake? Or it's really a cheap fake that matters? And how could we make an omni-channel attack? So if you are part of the red teaming team, or you do the red teaming basically by yourself, this is also a really good thing because we are leveraging the AI deepfake and so on into the model of the red teaming. It's actually working brilliantly. And the question is why? You know, like you, you, you could see that there is an era store of the Taylor Swift. So my team decided also, uh, being on the line of a Taylor Swift that I look similar. And I said, yeah, right, like, if you take the Taylor Swift and you wash her in, like, 90 degrees of Celsius, that's going to be me. So eventually, um, we decided to train this model. And this app is basically Deep Face Lab. This is how it's called. And we came up with something like this. So this is a six hours of training. In your opinion, like, thumbs up or down? 
kind of like mixing. Okay, thank you. I see you are hesitating. Me too. I'm not a, that much of a big fan of it. The face is a little blurry. Yeah, so let's say this is a failure. Yeah, uh, but deep face web. We paid eighty dollars, and it took us approximately twenty minutes to generate this. Have a look. And it's like not, not looking like Taylor Swift. I like that because I look like twenty years ago. So I would give it like a. Yeah, but this is not the theme right now. So eventually, uh, I'll be like, nah, well, I will not believe it. But check this out. There is a Reface app, and um, and Reface is on your mobile device, and it's a paid app. I'm not advertising anything, uh, never. So you can check it out. But here's a, actually a result, and it's not a Taylor Swift anymore, because apparently I'm not looking similar, but that's basically this lady. Looks cool, yeah? Do you agree? Thumbs up or down? Up, up. In most of the cases, up. Yeah, I agree. It's actually a pretty good deepfake. And you know what? When you take that, and this is just for the reference and comparison, when you compare it and you put it on into the attacks that are basically mobile device related, so for example, you add the voice, the video, and so on, then this becomes a really nice omnichannel attack. Have a look. This attack, by the way, it's illegal in Switzerland, so I cannot do it for, uh, for life. So you can see Mike's face. We are recording this in the United States because over there, surprisingly, it's legal till you commit the crime. Okay. So who is calling over there? Mr. Chunky. Nothing special is happening. You, you, Mr. Chunky is just like in the contacts booked, yeah? But uh, here we're gonna use the application, which is a little shady, honestly. It's a three-way I.O. where you can pay, pay with a little coins and stuff like that. So you decide whether you wanna use it, but yeah, it's a little shady. And what we're going to be doing over there, we're going to be spoofing that call. So there is a spoof call uh, case. And again, it's a known thing, but it's also a motive for the attack. So we specify two things here. Who are you calling? And then we are specifying the number that we are calling. So here we go. And then we are specifying which number we want to be displayed. Yeah. And then we are specifying the number that this person on the right must have in the contacts book. And we're going to send that basically as a option over here. So it's a little bit of a payment. Yeah, why not? And then as you can see that the same phone is calling, but this time we are recognized as a rocket CEO. Again, known attack, but then when you combine it, for example, with the voice fake, which for, for which, by the way, you need approximately, and this is really funny, 15 minutes of someone's voice right now to have like a basic conversation, then someone picks up and then it's like a, someone with an accent, English speaking boss, and like it happened with the guy, it's a famous story in Hong Kong, who actually transferred $25 million and he made it public and he said to the world, you know the story, yeah? So he said to the world that basically, hey, I've been actually scammed. This is a voice deep, voice deep fake or voice fake. And eventually this has been, this has been uh, made public. So it's not a future, it's, it's presence. Now you can use it in two ways. One, to warn your employees and to educate your employees or to use it in the red teaming. But this is a bad idea because, as I mentioned, it's illegal. Yeah. Unless you're doing the red teaming in US, then do whatever you want. But, um, the point is that, <laughs> the point is that, um, there is also lots of support in this kind of motives for the omnichannel attacks that could be leveraged at the end. And one of the other priorities is checking for the legacy configuration or misconfigurations, default settings, and so on. You know, what's my favorite, like, there is a reason why I started to think, and I apologize, but I could, I really think so. That pentas are a little, I don't know how you feel, but I feel that it's just not, it's not challenging, you know? It's like you go to work and then you access the computers, like the systems, you manage to break in. And normally when I was younger, I would be like, this is so exciting, yeah? But now I was like, yeah, another time it worked, yeah? Yeah, we're in, yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, job done report, yeah? So the point is that lots of things are repeatable and uh, it's a little disturbing. And uh, what I would have to actually bring on, it's simply a situation, not only with the password spray, but let's combine it of how we are able actually to get access to the domain admin. So first of all, we're gonna get the users, yeah? And then the second part, we will specify, uh, of course, what are those? You could see that where is, we got Jennifer, Jessica, Jeremy Brooks, here we go. And uh, this is basically how we're gonna be moving forward. So uh, we're gonna use the CrowdMob exe, for example, to do the password spray. And to do it ethically, we've got a possibility, for example, 
that we could be, uh, let's just, uh, we could be keeping this one. Uh, there could be a possibility that eventually we're going to lock people out. So to do it ethically, you need to use like two, three probes maximum. And obviously what we are getting over there, it's a situation where we've got some kind of a user. Yeah. So um, that's it. Now, when you are already a domain user, you've got so much to do. And you can see that in my case, Jeremy Brooks, it's there. Yeah. So he changed the password some time ago. Yeah. And eventually, and there's also James Bond and so on. And the question would be, what can you do? And one of the things you can do, you can definitely ask for the Kerberos tickets that are within the domain. And uh, eventually, if you're going to use like whatever other password and so on, we could be doing the password one dot or whatever, then there's going to be someone. When you're going to use the company, name 2024, there's going to be someone. And last time, basically, I was doing the password spray for the approximately 9,000 people company. There was 29 accounts that were having the username and uh, not the username, but the company name and 2024. So uh, it's very rewarding. Yeah. So at the end, um, what we're going to be looking for is basically the uh, service principal names for the possibly service accounts, uh, because we're going to be asking them for the tickets. And uh, as simple as this. So here we've got over there a bunch of accounts listed that basically have the service principal names. And we could be actually making it a little bit more um, into details. So for this, of course, we've got the LDAP search. Uh, and then we're going to specify that uh, that should be the service uh, principal name. Uh, and we're going to be requesting the tickets. So here we go for all of them, requesting the tickets for all of these accounts um, in a moment. But first, we'll need to find out what that is. Yeah. And you can see that we've got Bob. So this is like your classic service principal name for the user. You can see that we've got a MS SQL, whatever. You can see that there is also some other ones, uh, SVC, AD migration. Yes. Yeah? So these particular ones, we're going to be actually overusing. And SVC, AD migration sounds like something that we might be actually overusing. And yet again, everybody can ask for the ticket. Yeah, because we are here talking about the simple attack, which is curb roasting. Yeah, so it's enough for someone to be the domain user. So if you're wondering how to start the attack from zero, that's basically one of the ways. Another way, another way is going to be the relay. Another one is going to be the DFS cores part. So eventually, we've got here a possibility to overuse this a little bit. And then we're going to use the famous in packet, get user SPNs. And then we're going to be specifying that and saving that into the curb rows file so that we can get all these tickets in. And then the next stage, it's going to be related with uh, just cracking that ticket. And it really depends on our physical capabilities over there. So we've got this one. So we got these accounts and we've got the SVC AD migration. And uh, long story short, uh, we will be able to crack them. And uh, well, your dictionary, your computing power and so on, that's basically what matters. And uh, our job is going to be simply to uh, crack it yep, right now. Because you can see that SVC um, AD migration, we can actually check it. Um, so let's just do Vim uh, and then for the Kerberos to see what's uh, in there. And this is basically our ticket. And if the password for someone never expires, it's going to be very convenient because that's why it's called roasting, so that you can get this ticket and roast it like a coffee beans, so that it's going to be like almost not dependent on time. So uh, just to verify, because we might actually go in a wrong way, that eventually, in this case, we can start um, we can start John, and then Curb Rose, and then we're going to be using the whatever. It's just a demo. Yeah, Rocky dictionary. We could be using any other better dictionary, so that at the end we'll be able actually to get this attack working. And it's going to take some time, honestly. But then eventually we're going to learn what is um, what is um, the password of this particular account. And now we're going to be a privileged user, domain user. We don't know, but at the end, we will be able actually to start this attack further. And uh, it's important to monitor also the lateral movement actions because there are lots of ways how we can perform the lateral movement. And as you can see, in this case, Superman22 is the password. So now we can take this account and move forward to do the 
better damage. So the number three, it's going to be the absence of insights look for persistence. In a previous example, we talked about the possibility to escalate from the regular user or from zero, really, to the user to possibly someone privileged and then jump across the um, environment. Now, obviously, the next step that we should be analyzing, it's the persistence. You know, one of the things that our customers are asking for uh, right now is, hey, can you jump in into infrastructure and we're going to give you a wake and search for the hidden threat. This is really cool, where knowledge, where knowledge really matters. And then basically you spend that five days in the customer side, and then you check possibly where could be persistent, what could happen, and so on. Because we could be dealing with some shadow situations, shadow data, where possibly we could be actually um, experiencing uh, just simply... Um, uh, the, the st little bit of a stealth mode, yes, because our solutions are not discovering it properly. Yeah? So eventually, when we are looking through persistence, what I would have to show you is actually a pretty interesting angle on that. And it's all the situations where knowledge matters. First situation actually comes in here. And let me pull out that machine. So you can see, basically, that uh, I've got um, this service. And eventually, if I'm going to do the get service... Um, for the, in this case, name PJ service, I got the service out and running. Yeah. So this is one of the situations. And then, um, what can I do? I can leverage something that we call SDDL. So the security definition, security descriptor definition language in here. So this is the first one where we've got a discretionary access control, deny. And then here we got delete child. This is for listing configuration. This is WP for stopping the service. DT, delete tree for basically pausing the service. And then SD standard or delete, yeah? And then we've got interactive users and all the other uh, entities. Now, uh, if you think that SDDL is friendly, it's absolutely not. This is probably one of the silliest things that is out there uh, because you have a WP shortcut, write property, which says write property, but it's actually responsible for stopping the service. Logical, right? We will totally figure it out. So then you got DT, delete tree, for deleting the file trees, but in the, in the world of services, that's for pausing the service, of course. Yeah? And all these things. But anyway, so we are stopping, uh, we are in this case, making the service invisible. So here we go. And then the question is, if I would query that service, will I see it? Of course, the answer is no. But the funny fact is that when we're going to do set service, and then we're going to specify name and forcefully name PJ service. And then we're going to specify the status. Then uh, we just do whatever. You can see that, and this is really funny, you can see that in here it says that the PJ service, pool of service, cannot be configured due to access denied. But we see it. Yeah. So question is who is asking who and what kind of APIs we are using. But the point is that when we look into the services, yeah, we've got the PJ service. And depending on the status as well, because this is outruns of the service, you can see that we don't see it. So outruns, and here is a little comment, will only show you the things that are, well, obviously outrunning, but you can also hide from outruns. So outruns is reading from the registry, and depends as who you're going to run it, it goes to the registry, and it may not have permissions as well to read that data. So could we hide from that? Absolutely. Yeah, and this service will not show up if it's, if it's stopped. If it's not outrunning. So again, we might be, ah, oh, okay, let me check with outruns. No, no, no. You need to basically go to the registry and verify what are the last modification dates in terms of a service tree in the registry. So you go to system and then basically local system uh, to, to the um, um, HKLM, of course. And then basically you go to the services node, so system services node, and then you verify what's going on. So at the end, you can see that outruns could be not helpful. Another example, that I've got. It's actually pretty easy but confusing, and that's what I really love about that. And uh, this is basically what we got, and it looks like this. And obviously, my favorite question here would be, we've got a file.txt. You've got a guest account. It's disabled. Ignore this. We don't care. In this case, as you can see, deny and allow. What are the permissions to the file for guests? Can guests open a file or not? And of course, it's a tricky question. Most of the people would answer no, because what? Deny takes precedence. This is not true. This is not true. Have a look. If we're going to go to advanced, 
And then basically, you're gonna, adv but advance is also not advanced, yeah, but anyway, you're gonna look at this, uh, and then you're gonna get into guest. What you're gonna see is that guest, uh, yeah, 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 guest, guest, guest. What you're gonna see is that guest actually has access. Yeah, and the question is, why is that so? Because in Windows, deny, it's not who wins. Deny is on the same level like allow. The same level. And eventually, uh, what we analyze always in Windows, it's the, it's the order. And some of you might know it, but for some of you, it might be like Santa Claus does not exist type of a message. So we've been believing for our whole life and now we are disappointed. So eventually, you can see that this window though, this window, like honestly, like do not trust it. Yeah. <laughs> who, who designed that should be punished. Because there's nothing we can conclude from it. As you can see, here order matters, and here what? Who goes first? We could be like, oh, maybe like when the guest is going to be in front, it's going to be better. So we could be, no, 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 this is not the thing. Um, maybe this is alphabetical, you know? Like maybe this e everyone, yeah, E stands before G, so it sounds like alphabetical. No. Like this window on the top, the users, they are sorted, but alphabetically by the seed. Who needs this? So do not, do not. Plus, uh, one more thing in the advanced window is that you don't see here G permissions, uh, because in operating system we've got a 32 access mask, and the most important, highly important bits, so the 31, 30, 29, and 28, that's our deep G permissions, generic all, like full control, that's 2 to the power of 28. This is, by the way, not shown in GUI. So this is basically persistence. So can you have full control over the folder and not be seen in GUI? Yes. What would help? Get ACL. And then you get full security descriptor. So SEDL is completely awesome. Okay, great. So we are running um, to the number four. And uh, the lack of a threat hunting skill set, what I would say. So important. Have a look. Uh, when we look at what to search for, yeah? So how to identify the threat, understand the threat, how to understand the risk, there is this little short list that I've got for you. But we could be thinking, yeah, but there's lots of things missing. I agree, because these things grow to this. Yeah, you will not find this list, it's just on my slide, but it's not, also not discoveries list, because these are the attributes we are looking for during the forensics. So uh, you got the slides, so you don't need to make notes or pictures or so, whatever. But my point is, how do we identify that the threat happens, and how do we understand that the threat is actually bigger or smaller? You know, this is this feeling that I'm always having in terms of, um, in, in terms of situation when there is like certain threat. And I'm always wondering, basically, how much did it escalate? And uh, yes, okay, user's computer has been attacked, but is it like a bigger thing that we think? And so on. You know, this 197 days, it's for a reason. And uh, that's what I'm thinking. And let me show you one really nice perspective on this. We've got a situation where we've got a user. And this is basically a little Freddy Krueger user, yeah? And uh, Freddy Krueger user, if we're going to be using it with the password password, yeah, like password password, like you see, yeah, we log in, and it's not a big deal. Freddy is a domain user. Freddy is also not following because he is not using KeePass or any other password manager, but he stores passwords in the browser. Yeah, yeah, the typical user thing. But the question is, what's the threat really behind that, and under which conditions someone could actually steal these passwords? And uh, that is so important to know. I honestly think that everybody in cybersecurity should know what I will show you. And uh, this is also quite interesting in terms of a pen test. So what we're going to do, first of all, we're going to do a little bit of an export here. I'm on a domain controller. So there is an attack going on. And hacker managed to be a domain admin. Or let me put it worse. An untrustworthy pen tester managed to become a domain admin. And then... We're going to do it. We're going to export NTDS to the DIT as our trophy. Now, what do we do with this? Because that NTDS DIT, of course, it contains lots of stuff, blah, 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 we know, but it also contains one juicy thing, a certificate that is not shown everywhere. And this is, by the way, a part of our research that we were doing for many years that I would love to show you. And uh, it's actually pretty nasty. So file exported PFX. 
So I'm exporting that certificate. It's a little, by the way, don't get me wrong. It looks like we are doing nothing because I'm just running some executable, exporting a file, and that's it. Here is two years of your work, yeah? But, um, but this is in general, uh, reverse uh, engineering for lots of components, including understanding by, like, any character what is happening in antideos.did. And that certificate, of course, uh, as we know, uh, well, I'm going to import it. I don't have to do it, but I just want to show you. Yeah, we are almost like done with this. So next, password was secure. Next, and then, and then let's do cert mgr.msc. Fantastic. And then personal certificates. And that, that certificate is also quite interesting because as you see, this is where what everybody has in their NTDS.dit. And this is a bad stuff, because you can see it's a little outdated, yeah? So this is the time when someone set up their domain. Can you change it? No. So what is relying on that certificate then? All of the credentials of every single user in the organization. So if you've got thousands of users working, all of their passwords and everything, every secret that they store depends on this. This is old. What if it leaked? You've got a problem. Can you change it? As I mentioned, no. By the way, honestly, whatever you think about, like, oh, how can I? Just think that the answer is no to this, yeah? Because you cannot fix it. And uh, otherwise, you're going to lose support and things like that. So technically, there are conclusions coming, obviously. But let me just continue, and we are almost done. So when we got that uh, situation here, I'm going to be getting access to the Freddy's computer, Freddy's credentials. And in this case, what I will do, I'm going to actually uh, perform this activity uh, using the uh, offline um, procedure, but we, I could do this online as well. So there are two options really for doing this. I'm going to do it offline because it's a little bit more smooth. And I'm going to be over here um, technically uh, overriding something that people call cache credentials. Again, please don't call it this way, because cache credentials aren't credentials. You cannot log on with some bush from the registry. You can only compare with the bush from the registry. So these are not credentials, yeah? But anyway, I will explain it deeper. So here we're going to go to the troubleshoot, very advanced options, which is a command prompt. Uh, this always makes me laugh, honestly. But okay, uh, so uh, let's go to the D drive. We're going to go to the CQ tools, and then for this, we're going to use, actually, the Mimikatz. This is our edition with the module for the overwriting uh, cache log on data. LSA dump, and then let's do, just do cache. Cache, 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 and then D, Windows, System32. Uh, here we go. And then config, and then we're going to do a uh, system. And then we're going to do D, and then again, Windows, System32, Convic, and then Security, and then slash Kiwi, Enter. Okay, so uh, I have right now overwritten cache log on data. This is also, by the way, very good forensically, because you can see what was the last time the users were logging on. Just to check, 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 we are disconnected from the network. We're going to be logging on with the cache log on data. Amazing. Almost done. So right now I'm logging on. The job is done. So when the credentials are different, we're going to see that basically they are uh, different uh, because I'm going to log in actually with a different credentials. And then we're going to see whether we are able to get access to this secret or not. And no, Mimi cuts. Enter. I managed to log in. And then basically, uh, we are checking whether we can get access to the user secrets. And I will tell you that the answer is no. So let's wait for it in the background, uh, because we have a different credentials. But that certificate from the domain will allow us to get access to these credentials. And let's do it. So we're going to do CQ tools, DP API. Here we go. We're going to generate the current hash of the user. So this is basically this. And then I'm going to do CQ master key AD with two things. First, PFX, exported PFX, new hash with the hash, and what I'm going to do with these things? Well, I have to find out the interesting way of getting credentials of the user. So find out where Chrome stores credentials. And also forensically, this is, by the way, amazing. Uh, not the CQ malware. That's a different thing. You don't want this. Yeah, here we go. And uh, CLS. And then we're going to go to the DP API. Uh, sorry. DP, DP API. No, no, this one, okay. And then uh, let me use for this the CQ DP API blob searcher with the directory uh, where normally you're going to run it on the C drive, 
but uh, we're going to be actually shortening it a little bit to put on the Google Chrome and then recursive output uh, for the, in this case, CQ tools or something. Let's do it into the file dpapi txt. And while we're doing this search, what are we looking for is actually a situation where uh, in the percent, update a percent for the user's profile, we're going to go to the Microsoft, Protect, SID, and we're going to be finding over there the uh, B55. So there is a, there is actually a key that I know is going to be actually displayed here that contains credentials for the users, uh, for the user in a Google Chrome. And this is what you find in here. Yeah, B55. So once we got that, yeah, then B55 is what we're going to need. Shift right click and then copy as path. We're going to put that in our console here, file, and then bring it on. We are decrypting it with certificate, encrypting it with our current password. Yeah, that is basically what's happening, yeah? Easy, right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, DP API allows us, so after a moment, to generate the key that will be basically allowing us to get access to these user's credentials. Yeah, we can make it a full screen. This is done. And now the very, very, or almost very last thing is that you can rename this guy, give it a, a whatever, underscore G or something, and then this one we're going to be renaming and then we're going to actually replace this master key, as we call it, with the correct one. The last part changes of an attribute for system and hidden. Yeah. So we got that. Enter. And then if it doesn't work, then I can go and sell coconuts to the rest of my life on the beach, which doesn't sound very bad too. But anyway, not today. Yeah, it worked. So what you can see, the password is there. What's the conclusion? Whoever has this certificate and whoever has this since 2012 or any other time was possible to read everybody's password stored everywhere in the infrastructure. What's our conclusion for this? Well, basically, when we are designing the security of the infrastructure, one of the things we should definitely think about is how do we set up the good monitoring because assuming that we are already compromised, because it's a good assumption here, it's time to have a really well-established monitoring. And then finalizing incident response readiness. Uh, so this is basically for the skills that we got. Uh, and uh, as you can see, 77% of organizations, they do not test their incident response plan, which could be supported, and this is the last point, with AI. And whenever we are thinking, for example, about learning new AI technologies and so on, things like KQL and so on, one of the suggestions that we always have is actually to use the chat GPT for this. And without really publishing any secret information uh, into the chat GPT, we could be writing, hey, Hey, write me a query that's going to be doing me this, this, and that. And if we feel that AI, KQL, or any other language basically is a challenge, AI is so supportive right now that we can really nicely grow in cybersecurity, and this is the suggestion that I would love to leave you with. So summarizing, investing human factor, building threat hunting skills, legacy, misconfigurations, uh, like, for example, SPMs, defining incident response, also looking for persistence, so shaping or reshaping pentas, supporting yourself with AI. This is basically a set of conclusions and my six points for you today to grow and to be better in cybersecurity. So, of course, make sure that you guys are going to download the tools. They were under the QR code that I was presenting. And if you're going to have some more questions, I'll be here at the, uh, close to the stage and at the event. So I'll be so much looking forward to have a conversation. So hopefully you enjoyed it. And thank you so much for being so hospitable. And uh, thank you for your time to uh, listen to the keynote. Thanks a lot.